Hello friends, hi, I'm Dr. Shonali and I welcome you all again to our YouTube channel Medicine Decoded. And in the last video, we had talked about the pathology behind beta thalassemia. And now we're going to talk about how beta thalassemia trait is different from iron deficiency anemia. Now, why am I talking about beta thal trait particularly when I'm talking about iron deficiency anemia? Because the one primary difference between beta thal major and minor. In our last video, we have talked about how thal major occurs when there is a severe or complete severe deficiency or a complete absence of beta chain synthesis, right? And homozygous individuals uh, have beta thal major and heterozygous individuals who have one abnormal copy and one normal copy, their beta chain synthesis is also affected but only mildly and beta thal minor will only have a mild anemia or maybe they will be entirely asymptomatic. Right? Now, the normal uh, values of hemoglobin A, A2 and F are given to you here on the slide in the adult life. Right? Now, what will happen in beta thal major? Since hemoglobin A levels are actually going to be undetectable or very minimal in amount, very minimal in amount. The A2 on the other hand is going to be slightly elevated, the other form, right, alpha 2, delta 2 chain, right. So, this will be mildly elevated about 4 to 10 percent in that range and the predominant form of hemoglobin in beta thal major patients becomes hemoglobin F. Persistence of fetal hemoglobin, you see, persistence of fetal hemoglobin. So, hemoglobin F is markedly increased about 96% in circulation, right? Now, the presentation. See, when the beta thal major is affecting the fetus, the fetus at that time is not showing the manifestations of thalassemia major simply because in fetal life, the predominant form of hemoglobin is HBF. So, the clinical presentation or the features that we discussed in the last video pertaining to thal major are going to be encountered or they are manifested when the child is about 6 to 9 months of age. So, when the child is beyond 6 months of age, that is the time, that is the time when, you know, there is a switch over, you see, fetal hemoglobin persists for about 6 months in, uh, uh, you know, of uh, childhood, 6 months of infant life and after 6 months, you see, the adult hemoglobin takes over. It is at this time, when the time for adult hemoglobin to take over comes, that the manifestations start becoming apparent and then worsening downhill until the treatment is instituted. So, the presentation is about 6 to 9 months of age and they will present with severe anemia plus all the other manifestations which we discussed in the last video. Now, talking about beta thal minor, let's see. The hemoglobin A in beta thal minor is reduced, right? The normal form of adult hemoglobin alpha 2, beta 2 chain, it is reduced to about 80 to 95 percent, right? The other form of hemoglobin HbA2 is more than 3.5 percent that is taken as the cut off, it is usually in the range of 4 to 10 percent and your HPF also rises to about 2 to 3 percent, more than 2 percent, right? So, what we see here is that the HBA is reduced but it is not absent. There is a slight increase in the other form that is HBA2 form. That is why there is only, you know, mild anemia or just asymptomatic and they do not have this classical presentation of beta thal major, right? Now, moving on further, let us talk about in detail now of how to differentiate thal trait with iron deficiency 
anemia. So like I discussed already, the thal trait is also going to show microcytic hypochronic anemia. The question that arises is, if it is mild, if it is asymptomatic, when do we suspect that a person coming to you could be having beta thal trait? How do you suspect? Now, you suspect that on the basis of maybe a family history, right? There is a sibling that is affected with beta thal major. Right? There is a parent with beta thal major or there is a parent who is a known carrier of beta thalassemia trait. Right? So that kind of a family history. If such kind of a family history isn't there, then high risk populations, high risk populations, they can be subjected to screening. So screening is a modality by which we can pick up beta thalassemia trait, we can suspect and then we can confirm. Right. So like, for example, not uh, not in uh, not uh, like I told you that the Indian subcontinent is also having a major incidence of beta thalassemia, particularly in the North Indian belt. So here when I'm practicing in Delhi here, we tend to, you know, uh, offer a routine screening to pregnant women for beta thalassemia trait because we know that this is an inheritable condition. If a woman is having beta thalassemia trait, she could transmit that abnormal gene to the offspring. If the partner or husband is also beta thal trait or beta thal major or something, you know, then it could lead to beta thal major in their offspring. So it has implications for genetic counseling, right? So more on this later. But yes, screening is one modality by which we can suspect and pick up beta thal trait. And otherwise, you know, Mild to moderate anemia, which we thought of as iron deficiency anemia and we began treating, is somehow not responding to the oral iron treatment that we've been giving, right? Or not responding to the uh, iron treatment, whichever iron treatment that we are giving, right? So that would mean probably that there is some other diagnosis at play. It could be beta thal trait because the beta thal trait can give a confusing blood picture with iron deficiency anemia and that is what we have to understand how to differentiate between the two. So both will have microcytic hypochromic anemia, both will have hemoglobin low, both will have a reduced uh, MCH mean corpuscular volume, right? Microcytic hypochromic anemia. So the MCV is also decreased, the MCH is also decreased, right? Now we can get a rough clinical idea and this is a useful test when you know in low resource settings. Or when you have not, you don't have the possibility to confirm uh, with other high-end tests. But we'll go step by step. So this particular index where we divide the mean corpuscular volume by the total red blood cell count, RBC count. This index is called as the Mentizer index. Now this will give us a rough idea. Let's see how. When the Mentzer index is less than 13, right? I remember 13 because of T. 13. If it is less than 13, and I say Mentzer 13 less than 13 and another T, I say this is possibly thalassemia. And if it is more than 13, it's possibly iron deficiency anemia. Why so? The question is why so? I gave you a trick of how to remember. Now I'll tell you why so. See, remember the, pathophysi remember the pathophysiology of iron deficiency and beta thal trait. In thal trait, which is anyways mild, there is some element of ineffective erythropoiesis that is taking place. There is some element of tissue hypoxia. There is some element of increased erythropoietin. There is some element of marrow expansion. There is increased erythroid activity. And the RBC count, the RBC count are usually more than 5 to the 5.5 millions per mm cube. Usually, the RBC count is more or less preserved. So the denominator is higher and the index is less than 30. Whereas in case of iron deficiency, 
and especially in the, as the iron deficiency is prolonged and it goes on to become from moderate to severe iron deficiencies and when completely iron stores are depleted right when completely iron stores are depleted what happens is that the rbc production is impaired we call iron deficiency anemias as hypoproliferative anemias so the rbc counts are usually less than 5.5 million per mm cube they might still be in the normal range mind you they might still be in the normal range but they are usually less there is some element of hypoproliferative anemia there so that's why the denominator being lesser the index comes out to be more than 30 in case of iron deficiency anemia so menser index could give you a rough idea to differentiate between thaltrate and iron deficiency anemia moving on further the other way to come to a differential diagnosis is by performing serum iron studies now serum iron studies are you know requiring a particular lab setup they are requiring uh, they are expensive right menser index is easy to do you see you just need the mcv and the rbc count but serum iron studies will be expensive but then they will be better they will give you a much better idea like how we discussed the iron deficiency anemia in great detail in iron deficiency anemia the serum iron levels are low the total iron binding capacity is increased more iron is bounding to the transferrin right so total iron binding capacity is increased the serum transferrin the stores are mobilized and used up so serum transferrin is low and the transferrin saturation transferrin saturation is also low we discussed this on our video of iron deficiency anemia and like i told you iron deficiency is the most common right most commonly encountered you are going to have to deal with it most of the time so remember that to the heart and then all other different types you start comparing it with iron deficiency anemia that is how you are going to remember it in the long term now let's talk about thaltrate here what about the serum iron levels there is nothing wrong there in fact the iron absorption is increased so the serum iron levels are either normal or maybe slightly increased maybe slightly increased right so mostly they are normal the iron binding capacity the iron binding capacity is a reflection of iron absorption right so here the iron binding capacity is also normal is also normal there is no anemia for because of iron deficiency in case of iron deficiency you see the capacity to bind iron is increased because now body needs more iron that's not the case here there is no iron deficiency here right so total iron binding capacity is normal what about the serum ferritin what happens to the stores stores are fine so the serum ferritin is normal or maybe slightly increased but in thalt rate they are usually going to be in the normal range right what about the transferrin saturation that will also be normal that will also be normal so in beta thalt rate your serum iron studies are actually all going to turn out to be normal if they are normal you and you can clearly differentiate with it iron deficiency anemia based on the serum iron studies but the problem is iron deficiency anemia is very common it's quite possible that somebody with a thalt rate is also having coincidental iron deficiency it's so common isn't it so coexistent iron deficiency could complicate the serum iron studies also so if you have a strong clinical suspicion right if you have a strong clinical suspicion and mostly it arises in the scenario when you have a patient of iron deficiency anemia blood picture suggestive of iron deficiency anemia iron study suggestive of iron deficiency anemia but that person is not responding to the oral iron treatment the iron treatment that you are giving right then it becomes very valuable to consider beta thalt rate and confirm it further so the confirmatory test for beta thalt rate is simple you need to check the levels of the types of hemoglobin in circulation 
and we can do that by doing high performance liquid chromatography. So, in the beginning of the slide itself, I told you that HbA in case of beta thalt rate is 80 to 95 percent, it is going to decrease. HbA2 is more than 3.5 percent, HbF is more than 2 percent, and knowing these will confirm your diagnosis of beta thalt rate. Now, how do we manage the anemia of thalt rate? How do we manage the anemia of thaltrate? Just one word there about it. That oral iron can be given in the face of iron deficiency. That's there, right? Oral iron can be given in the face of iron deficiency. The other important thing is that in thaltrate, we saw that the cause of their anemias is ineffective erythropoiesis and some element of extravascular hemo uh, hemolysis. So, there is the lifespan of the RBCs is decreased. What does that mean? That means RBCs are formed and then they are quickly destroyed. When they are quickly destroyed, more and more are formed. So, in circulation, destroyed, taken away, more formed quickly and quickly. So, there is a rapid turnover of RBCs in the circulation. For that rapid turnover in RBC in the circulation, understand, go back to your basics and understand that for red blood cell formation, you see, iron is not the only nutrient. Iron is a component of hemoglobin true, but folic acid is also required. I mean, the erythroblasts in the bone marrow, they also have a nucleus to begin with. The nucleus is eliminated much later. So, you need folic acid, you need the other nutrients as well. And rapid turnover of cells, whenever it happens in the body, produces a state of relative folic acid deficiency, relative folate deficiency. So, to meet that rapid turnover, of cells of RBCs in circulation, one needs to supplement it with oral folic acid, right? So, coexistent iron deficiency can be treated with, um, uh, you see, um, oral iron supplementation. Uh, you should be giving high dose uh, folate uh, therapy as well, right? High dose oral foral, uh, folate therapy, like 5 milligram per day daily dosages of folic acid should be given. So, these are the two things. Uh, and, uh, you know, one should also keep in mind that until unless the anemia is severe, they don't need blood transfusions. They usually don't require uh, repeated or regular blood transfusions. One is that. Uh, they, uh, until unless there is evidence of iron overload, you know, they will not require iron chelating agents like in Thal Major. So, they will do, they will fare well. What is important to understand here is that never ever in thaltrates, will you give injectable iron? Do not do that, okay? Because when you give injectable iron, you give it by intramuscular route or you give by intravenous route, whichever route. When you give that amount of iron by parental, parental route, let's say, when you give it all together, all that iron that you have given goes to the stores. It stays there. You have replenished the stores and from the stores, it is going to slowly come out into the circulation to correct the hemoglobin levels. That's the principle of parenteral iron. If you give parenteral iron to people with beta thalt rate, they have normal iron stores. You're going to precipitate iron overload. Excess iron is toxic. You don't have to give them any extra amount of iron right and not at all by parenteral route. So, keep that in mind. So, these are the clinical reasons why it is important to make a distinction between beta thaltrate and anemia. Confusing blood picture, yes, you want to treat the anemia. If it is not getting treated by your regular iron, do consider polis, you know, possibility of beta thaltrate. You eliminate beta thaltrate, let's say, if it still turns out to be iron deficiency anemia, you can give parenteral iron. You know, you can give blood transfusions also. But in thaltrate, the stores are adequate. You don't want to give parenteral iron. All that you need to do is, you know, advise them on a good diet. Advise them on, you know, increasing their iron intake. Only in the face of iron deficiency, concomitant iron deficiency, do they need an oral iron supplementation because their iron stores are 
fine. What they need is oral folic acid high dose supplementation to meet the rapid turnover of RBCs that happens in that situation, right? And finally, you need to advise them or you need to take care that, you know, hemolytic crisis is avoided. So, let's say I would advise them like, you know, to uh, take care not to take drugs which are known to cause hemolysis, right? In states of infection, sepsis, you know, uh, th these are the states or uh, where, you know, hemolytic crisis can be precipitated. So, I will just try to be cautious about that aspect in their management. So, this is how you are going to differentiate and think about the clinical implications of differentiating thaltrate from iron deficiency anemia. Whenever you are in that situation, do think about why you want to differentiate, how you differentiate, what are its clinical implications, how does it change your management? So, these are certain questions which need to be clinically answered and we have discussed that in this video. Uh, give me a feedback about whether you liked it or not. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Have a great day.